five years minimum, big, expensive, dangerous trip. Educated people spent a lot of money, left home, comfort, and safety, seeking this king to worship. Follow their example. He is worth it. He is worth it. Seek Jesus. Seek Jesus because he will satisfy you. Now, some people were not seeking Jesus. Herod was surprised. He was troubled, verse 3 tells us. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. There's a lot, there's, there, this is an ominous, ominous little verse. There's a shadow over this little verse. Uh, we know, if you know the Christmas story very well at all, you know that not long after this, uh, Herod is going to murder hundreds of children, maybe thousands maybe thousands, probably hundreds of children. We actually know a lot about this Herod. We know a lot from the archaeological record, a lot from historians that lived at this time. Herod was an absolute nutbag of a ruler. He was crazy. And it would be funny if he wasn't so much into cutting people's heads off. When Herod got mad, people died, and Herod got mad a lot. He was a paranoid, sad little man. And he killed a lot of people. He was troubled. And that is why all Jerusalem, it says, is troubled with him. When Herod's not happy, nobody's happy. So why was he so afraid? Why was Herod so afraid? Well, Jesus is born the king of the Jews. Did you catch that? The wise men said that. Jesus is born the king of the Jews. Herod's been appointed the king by the Roman overlords. And he's not even a Jew. This Jesus represents a threat to his power. And so he wants to know too. And so in verse 4, he gathers, Herod gathers all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together and demands to know where the Christ should be born. And they say to him, In Bethlehem and Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the princes of Judea, for out of you shall come a governor that shall rule my people. Here we see this amazing contrast. These, these, uh, these messianic wise men came from the other end of the earth and knew that Jesus is going to be born somewhere around here, around this time. Herod, the king, of the, the king, big air quotes, of the Jews, doesn't have any idea where. He's got to call the subject matter experts and find out. And it turns out it's Bethlehem, which is funny, because it's about two and a half miles from where he is right now. These guys came from the end of the earth. Herod's literally sitting on this. Then Herod, when he had privately came, called the wise men and inquired them dil diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search diligently for the young child. When you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. And when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When the star saw when the, they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. <clears throat> you know what Herod's planning? He doesn't actually want to worship the, the king of the Jews. He's planning to try to stop all of this. And it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Don't be like Herod. That's, that's a real simple thing you can take away from church. Don't be like Herod. Receive the king, even if it means traveling across the world that you know. Even if it means giving up a lot. Even if it means taking big risks. Receive the king. Don't try and suppress him. The wise men find what they're looking for. The Bible tells us, if you search for God with all of your heart, you will find him. The wise men sacrifice a lot. They take a great risk. They find what they're looking for. Herod tries to destroy it. Herod tries to destroy what they're looking for. He fails. He falls upon the rock that he's trying to break, and he breaks himself. Receive him, as they do here at the end of our passage. When they heard, excuse me, in verse 10, when they saw the star... 
they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him and had opened their treasures. Luke's language here is very vivid. Uh, you see all these verbs and, and participles. They rejoiced, exceeding great joy. These guys were ecstatic. They were happy. They're probably jumping up and down and clapping and crying and singing. They had worked for a long time for this. This was a really big deal. And so they come into the house, which is probably a pretty humble house. They see the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fall down and worship him. And what we see here is the Bible's first baby shower. If you've ever wondered where baby showers are in the Bible, this is as close as you get. But they are, it's, it happens. Now, they, they give him three gifts. They give Jesus three gifts, and the gifts are fascinating. In the church, Christians have spent a long time thinking about the three gifts, and rightfully so. So the gifts are gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, there are a lot, there are several Old Testament passages about foreign people coming from across the world to give gifts to the Messiah. This is something the Old Testament prophesies about a lot. And some of these prophecies even mention gold and frankincense. This is something that happens in the Old Testament. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, though, this is, a, this is an interesting combination. Gold, uh, pretty straightforward, I, we're familiar with gold. Gold very much symbolizes kingship that this baby Jesus has been born as a king. It symbolizes power and royal authority. The thing about gold, we think of gold as valuable, and indeed it is. What impressed the ancients very much about gold is how heavy it is, how weighty it is. And also, it doesn't react with things. It's pretty hard to dissolve gold or mess with gold. Gold is, is set apart. It's special. It's, it has dignity. It touches kingship. And so the gift of gold, Christian, the first time Christians really started talking about this, as far as we know, is in the year, about the year 500, people start writing about this. This is a very old idea. Gold very much reflects Jesus' royalty. Frankincense. Frankincense is something else. Frankincense is the resin. If you ever smelt it, it's a very, you can buy it. You can, you could go on Amazon tonight and buy frankincense. I don't know if it will be here in time for Christmas, but you can get frankincense if you ever want to just get some frankincense and see what it smells like. It's pretty neat stuff. It's a very pungent uh, kind of pine smell to it. And it is used, it's used in worship services. It's burned as an incense before God in worship services in the Old Testament quite a bit. The frankincense is the tool of the priest. The priest and it is given to God. The gold symbolizes, speaks to Jesus' kingship. The frankincense speaks to his divinity and to his priestly status. The myrrh, though. The myrrh is the most interesting of the three gifts. The Bible doesn't say a lot about myrrh, but we do know that myrrh, which is another kind of tree resin, it's essentially, you you, you know how you make maple syrup? You, you plug a hole in a tree and maple syrup comes out. Same thing with myrrh. You find a myrrh tree, you plug a hole in, and then sap comes out, and you dry it and process it, and you get myrrh. And it's this very sticky, strong-smelling stuff. It's used in making perfumes. It's also used in embalming bodies. And that's really the main use, as far as anybody can tell. And it's the only use we – well, one of the only uses we see of it in the Bible. In fact, it was used on a very dark day, about 33 years after Christmas Day. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate allowed him. And he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And came also Nicodemus, the first that came, by, came to Jesus by night. And he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. And they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloth and spices, as is the manner of the Jews to bury the gold speaks to Jesus' royalty. The frankincense speaks to his divinity. The myrrh speaks to his death. King and God in sacrifice. Now, we don't know if that's what Luke intended when he wrote it this way. This is inspired of God. It's from God as much as Luke. 
We don't know if God meant, or if God, well, you don't know if God meant exactly this, but we see these themes, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, touching Jesus' kingship, his divinity, and his death, and how they speak to the themes of the Bible. Seek him for who he is. He is the king of the universe. We celebrate him because he is the king come to make things right. And that can be scary because that means he's also the king come to make you right. And uh, there, there's a, there was a very, a very smart, funny, intelligent man once that uh, a magazine wrote him a letter. He, they, wanted, they wanted him to write an essay. And the, the topic with the essay was, what is wrong with the world? Everybody wanted to know what this guy thought. Hey, what's wrong with the world? And so he wrote back his response to be published. Dear sirs, I am. We need to be fixed. We need a king to fix us. Nobody that we can elect is going to fix us. We need a king, one come from the outside. That doesn't alleviate our responsibilities. We still have to do everything that we can, but we need help from the outside. And that's why we can celebrate, because the king has indeed come and will come again. And not just a king, not just a king, but also our God, our priest, our way to be reconciled with heaven, and our sacrifice. Covered in myrrh on the day of his death, wounds in his hand, wounds in his feet, blood poured out to cover our sins. Even now, as we celebrate Christmas, we look to his death. And so the Magi took this wonderful pilgrimage, crowned, crowned with worship, full of holy joy and humble reverence. They sought Jesus, and he satisfied them. Herod received the same truth from the Magi, but he rejected, he schemed, he conspired, and was ultimately destroyed. Receive him for who he is. If you reject him, you will be destroyed like Herod. But tonight is a night that we celebrate. We celebrate who he is and what he has come to do. And I hope that you do receive him. If you have not, he listens now. This, this is not some spooky wackadoo thing. He liter Jesus literally listens now. He made you. He knows what you need. He is able to save you if you will receive him. Ask him now to save you, to be your king, to be your God, to be your sacrifice. And having received him, rejoice with us. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Lord, for this evening that you've given us, for this opportunity to celebrate you for who you are. Jesus, bless us and bless our time with our families. Tomorrow, may we be lights in the world, reflecting you the great light. We pray these things in your name. Amen. As we close this evening, we are going to sing hymn number 219, 219. If you're able stand to stand with me tonight, we will sing this song together as we close.
of prayer. Father, thank you for the season we have again. We thank you for the truth of this season of your word. And I pray that we would share you with those around us. May we have a wonderful time with family. May you be honored in all that we do and that we say. Give us safety, Lord, as we travel home tonight. And may our, our hearts and our minds be fixed on you. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we ask and pray all of these things. Amen. Thank you.